Uh, good afternoon, all of you again. Um, I'm Dr. B. D. Shanoi. I'm the managing uh, editor of Microasia. Uh, today we are here to listen to a, pu a public lecture or a popular lecture by Professor Kandikere Sridhar. Uh, uh, Kandikere Sridhar Ramaya. He was my MSc teacher and uh, he has agreed to, he has kindly agreed to give this lecture. Uh, be, uh, before I hand over this stage to him, I would like to give a brief introduction to about uh, Professor Sridhar. Uh, professor Sridhar is an adjunct uh, professor at, uh, at the Department of Biosciences, Mangalore University. Uh, as I told you, he was my teacher during my MSc studies at the University of Mangalore. Uh, his uh, area of research uh, is uh, uh, diversity and ecology of freshwater fungi of the Western Ghats and uh, mangrove and marine habitats of the West Coast of India. He is an uh, excellent teacher. Uh, he is an ac accomplished researcher. Um, as you can, uh, as you, as some of you may know, he has published more than 450 research publications in national and international uh, journals. He is one of the top two percent of the world scientists in the field of mycology as per the survey of Stanford University in 200, uh, 2020. Um, he was the NSCRC postdoctoral fellow in Mount Ellison University, Canada. Uh, he was a visit visiting scientist at the Department of Agriculture Technology, King Mongoods in Institute of Technology, Bangkok. And he is on the editorial boards of uh, the journals like International Journal of Agriculture Technology, Mycology, Microsphere, Journal of Microbial Biosystems, Asian Journal of Mycology, MycoAsia, our own journal, and the Kavaka, the Transactions of the Myco Mycological Society of India. He, uh, his achievements, uh, in, in few words, he has won the Show Memorial Award in 2014, uh, 2004. He was the vice president of MSI in 2013. He was the president of MSI in 2018. He was the recipient of Lifetime Achievement Award by the Mycological Society of India in 2019. He is a fellow of Indian Mycological Society, Kolkata. Uh, he, he, is a distinguished, he was a distinguished, distinguished Asian mycologist in the year 2015. He, has, he, is, he was a recipient of Outstanding Leader in Educational Research um, by the Association of Agriculture Technology of Southeast Asia, Thailand in the year 2016. Uh, with these words, I would like to request uh, Professor Sridhar to start his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shanae, for uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, Dr. Shanae and also Mycoasia uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak about fungi of fresh water. Uh, that is my first, uh, that is my prime interest in research to start with in the year 1978. <clears throat> uh, so all of us are aware that uh, fungi, it is kingdom, just like that of plant kingdom and animal kingdom, they have evolved independently is an independent line and uh, they are divided out, they, they have no chlorophyll to trap the photons and they do not have human like animals and therefore they have powerful enzyme system and also metabolites to utilize the organic waste and, uh, and also a lot of uh, recalcitrant material will be transformed into useful form and also they recycle. We can see a wide range of uh, fungi, microscopic to macroscopic, and a wide range of habitats. Sometimes it is highly unexpected habitats where we can find fungi because of their ability to colonize. And they <laughs> many human requirements. Although some of them are dermatophytes, and even plant pathogens are threatening, but still we are depending on for various purposes, food and food processing, uh, decomposition of organic matter, pharmaceuticals, biofuels, biopesticides, bioprotectants, and uh, many of the recently lot of merchandise, merchandise can be produced by them uh, because of uh, the advancement in mycology. 
that is beyond uh, food, uh, beyond nutrition and health. So they are industrially valuable pigments and so many leather-like constraints and so on and so forth. So I have mentioned that they have varied lifestyle. They have parts, terrestrial, you name any uh, conditions they are going to survive, uh, aquatic, anaerobic. We can find a lot of uh, fungi in the rumen. So that is how, although they are, they can survive in anaerobic condition and perform some functions, and not as much as bacteria, but they are present. And thermal, the temperature, uh, where the temperature is high or low, there we can find, and association with plants and animals, uh, algae, like that. They have a lot of uh, habitats where to survive and also perform some of the functions. Uh, all these functions depending upon the situation, at what conditions they survive. And sometimes they may not perform certain functions because of the uh, conditions prevailing. And when the conditions are optimum, they may uh, they uh, perform their functions. Sometimes they may shut off some of the functions, but uh, depending on the conditions, they perform some of them. So what are the specific roles? All of us are aware that that is forming a sort of network to connect different plants. They have very high bioconversion ability, especially organic matter. Uh, they form a network and they have tremendous ability of bioconversion of organic matter and even some of the recalcitrant materials. And they are the major players of biogeochemical cycle. What we uh, study about biogeochemical cycles, uh, and they have major role in different ecosystems. And they uh, channelize the nutrients uh, to different parts like that. And we are all aware of that mycorrhiza, uh, endo mycorrhiza and ectomycorrhiza, they are very, very important partners of plants for their growth and also stress tolerance and such things. They share uh, nutrients, that is the distribution. They produce varieties of hormones and these hormones promote growth, especially in plants and they are antagonistic and uh, also they cause diseases and uh, uh, and also they are antagonistic to disease causing agents and also invaders, especially uh, insects. They are going to attack the plants. Their endophytic fungi are responsible for uh, better than some of the uh, aspects we can study often. A stress tolerance in plants mainly by fungi and also detoxification of recalcitrant compounds. So we the the debate on fungal diversity, all of us are aware that the debate on estimate is 0 0.5 million to 9.9 .9 million. Some people will agree, some people will not agree. And uh, the median is somewhere between 5, 5.5 or 5.25 or somewhere around that. So with regard to fungal diversity, you know, the dilemma uh, is uh, that is 0 0.5 to 9.9 .9 million. But conservative estimate is 1.5 to 3 million. Reasonably accepted estimate is more than 3 million. This is mainly based on the angiosperm fungus ratio. So that is 1 is to 6 ratio. Uh, that ultimately give us approximately 1.5 million fungi exists in the world globally. But the ratio differs from one region to another region. So even in the, within the region, we can segregate them with regard to the diversity of angiosperms. Uh, and uh, the current ratio is 1 is to 6 is a little bit biased for the temperate regions, but expected in tropical ratio is approximately 1 is to 33. Therefore, the estimate sometimes has to be um, revised many occasions depending on the region and also uh, the vegetation and such things. Uh, these are, this, this slide is uh, providing some information about the estimate of described eight fungal phyla published in 2018, this comes to approximately 144,140, that is the number. And uh, this is approximately 13 to 14 percent of the uh, anjai what we expect is known. And the uh, rest of them is nothing but a black box. We have no idea where are they, what are they, 
what are their ecological issues, what do they do, all such things. So that's why I mentioned it as a black box. Uh, to discuss about the terrestrial and aquatic microbiome, uh, terrestrial mycology is uh, history is more than 100 years, more than a century. A lot of work has been done on terrestrial mycology. But aquatic mycology is quite recent and the most of the part of this aquatic mycology is dark matter. But the, now the technology has improved and the, tech, the several techniques have been introduced. C13 enrichment technique uh, is indicating that phospholipid derived fatty acids indicating that the fungi are tenfold higher than bacteria in the aquatic system. And similarly, C14 acetate, that is the, and also tritium uh, bacterial DNA, is also proving that fungal production is more than bacteria, especially in aquatic ecosystem. Uh, the fungal annual production, if you think of 16 to 193 gram per square meter, so dependent on the availability of the organic matter. If the organic matter is sufficiently available, we can expect 16 to 133 grams per uh, square meter of the area. So now, the aquatic and semi-aquatic uh, biosphere is also one of the important aspects because many aquatic fungi survive in semi-aquatic conditions. Uh, not only, uh, not, not exactly in the completely dried condition, but they may survive under specific dry conditions. And especially the heritage ecosystems, a lot of heritage ecosystems we have, and where we can expect very interesting aquatic fungi. Uh, how much of fresh water we have? So that is very, very meager. Now saline water is 97%. 97%. That is ocean, sea, and groundwater altogether consists of 70, 97%. But fresh water is 2.5 to 2.8 percent. Again, we can segregate uh, fresh water 1.8 to 2 percent glaciers, ice, and snow, and again 0.5 to 0.8 groundwater uh, and soil moisture and such things. And surface water in lakes, swamps, and rivers is less than 0.01 percent. But although the fresh water quantity is very less compared to saline water, we are all depending on fresh water for our daily life, our life-saving liquid and also human civilization. All of us are aware that human civilization evolved besides the wherever water is available, fresh water is available. So therefore, we have to, we are a lot of dependence on fresh water, but with regard to mycology is concerned, fresh water mycology is a neglected field, the area, not many people are working. Uh, we can count in finger, fingers because very few people are working on in this area. So these are referred as Ingoldian fungi because Ingold, in 1942, he has given a wide definition for the aquatic fungi. They are referred as aquatic hyphomycetes. And what he did was, uh, he was uh, out of curiosity, he went to his backyard and uh, uh, there was a small creek and he collected some foam material, scum material and foam material accumulated in the stream and for his surprise he could find lots and lots of uh, uh, multi-radiate uh, and sigmoid uh, spores that is present and when he saw under microscope he realized that these are fungi, they are fungal spores, they have adapted to flowing water condition. In fact, in the late 18th century, some of these uh, spores have been mistaken as algae and they have described it. There are some reports that they have described it as algal member. In the early 19, uh, that is early 19th century, they have corrected these things and ultimately they decided that these are fungi, not uh, algae, like that. Anyway, so they are, they perform a lot of uh, ecological services, especially plant litter decomposition and energy flow, uh, especially in the aquatic ecosystem. So, so the, although we have a lot of information about the uh, photosynthesis, that is the primary producers and also secondary producers, the detritus food chain has been totally neglected because 
detritus is the material where the uh, the microorganisms, especially bacteria and fungi, colonize and they uh, disintegrate the detritus to the higher trophic level. That's how energy flow starts from the detritus food chain, and uh, that the uh, the extent of uh, importance given to primary production and secondary production is uh, not given to the extent to the uh, detritus food chain. Anyway, so the species richness uh, of uh, Angolian fungi or the aquatic hyphomite is highest at the mid latitudes, that is the temperate streams. The mid latitudes, the highest number of uh, species diversity is very high. And uh, uh, with regard to community similarity between the geographically distant locations, uh, we can see similar climatic zones and the number of species also more. Uh, uh, species uh, structure is also more or less similar. That's what uh, uh, Professor Ingold was mentioned earlier in 1942 that if you collect the foam from any stream or a river and if you analyze the foam, you can roughly guess the, the, uh, the latitude of the region. So that is how he has uh, impressed people with regard to the importance of Ingoldian fungi and it is literally true. Uh, by recent uh, uh, publications in 2016. So we have at present the total morpho species of 335 species and uh, they are the major component of that the food chain. So we know only 335 but there are so many species not described because our effort is not up to the mark like that of terrestrial mycology. <clears throat> so here is I have given some points here. There are the major fungi in lotic waters, but the flowing waters, of course, they are also existing in the lentic waters too, and even sometimes estuarine and other regions. Uh, they are key fungi in aquatic food web. They are also present beside streams. They are outside the streams. In the banks, you can find, you can also find in the canopy uh, and also bar flow or the stem flow, like that. Decomposition. And energy flow is one of the major uh, function of this. And that it all depends on the diversity of the substrates. What substrates this fungi get? Is, are they getting only leaves? Are they getting only woody material? Are they getting only roots? Are they dead roots? Are they getting any other substrates from the inflorescence, flowers, and so on and so forth? Depending on the substrates, they flourish. So they established as a model fungi to test detritus food chain because it is easy to uh, evaluate these organisms because they colonize uh, the fragile material like leaf material to that of the woody, very recalcitrant woody material. So therefore, they have a wide range of substrate preference and they grow. Uh, so if these organisms can also be utilized for the purpose of aquatic quality assessment so, and also abatement of pollution like that. If we add some pollutants, what happens to this community? So one of the beauty of this group of organisms is uh, we, we are not uh, dealing with single organism. It is a community, so aquatic hyphomycid community. You are going to take the community as a whole to evaluate the function of a particular ecosystem and how this community is going to vary with perturbations or chaotic situation. So, uh, some of the uh, uh, work we have carried out in Western Guards. Uh, in India, uh, Western Guards is one of the major uh, regions where uh, research has been carried out by uh, our group and also Professor DJ Bhatt and uh, recently Dr. Borse has done and also Central Himalaya Dr. Sati, Satish Sati is another person working in Himalaya. So like that, there are very few regions where aquatic hyphomites is uh, drawn attention of uh, uh, people. So about, uh, about uh, nearly 20 species have been reported from India alone, but there are, uh, of course, there are 335 species. India has contributed up to 30 species and our own uh, research has contributed two species of uh, aquatic hyphomites. One is uh, uh, Tricidophorus conagensis. So I am being in this campus, Mangalore University campus. A very, there is a small stream, a creek uh, flowing through, and uh, I constantly 
find this special for us uh, new species and that has been erected in 1987 or 88 i erected as special for another one from the western guards that is uh, cinnamata for a constrictor so that is a sigmoid spore producing cinnamatous fungus so the new genera and also new species like that um, these are the type of spores we can find in nephrotic mites there are two major uh, type of spores one is colecoid or they are the uh, sigmoid spores so the eel like spores so something like eel like spores and also some of them are very peculiar like hairpin like structures and the z shape structures and also some of them are uh, uh, just uh, artistic like or just uh, uh, some of them are, yeah there are different types of uh, sigmoid type this is one of the uh, type of spores we can see in the aquatic in the freshwater bodies and one of the interesting aspect is it is something like a, uh, when it is large on a surface on a uh, surface of leaf surface or any other surface what happens is two points are going to touch the uh, substrate so the either the back portion of this and one of the tip portion is going to touch so by that they are going to produce a fasoria from here or from here and they colonize the uh, metal uh, organic metal but they have to follow the ruderal strategy because they are very very uh, they are growing on leaf material because leaf material is going to degrade very fast because there is a, there are other competitors like invertebrates the invertebrates also compete for the food the dead uh, leaf material therefore they have to follow the ruderal strategy where i will talk about the ruderal strategy strategy later so the another type of spores what we can find this is toroid type uh, here uh, you can see uh, tetra radiate or tri radiate or bizarre shape shapes and with here when when a particular spore is going to lodge on the surface at least three points are going to uh, be large on the surface of leaf material by that it has advantage the sigmoid ones so here three points the three uh, points adhere to the substrate and they uh, will germinate and efficiently colonize the um, leaf material uh, these are some of the photographs uh, i have drawn from the literature and also our own uh, literature so starting from simple uh, conventional type of conidia of sigmoid conidia and then tri radiate and uh, tetra, tetra radiate these are the tri radiate ones tetra radiates and multi radiate see here there is this is flavellus for the verticillata so uh, there is another species in Fabulous for Avertis later. That is, I got it in Western Guards about 21 arms. So here there is a central point, here there is an attachment site, and all the arms are there. It is something like a, a, a bar like thing it, is, it can roll around like that. So these are all adaptations to the planktonic adaptation because one of the authors uh, says, one of the pioneers in aquatic uh, mycology says that. Especially in gold, what he says that they are uh, they uh, originated from the aquatic freshwater body and they migrated into the terrestrial condition and from terrestrial condition they re-migrated into the aquatic situation. Therefore, they have to lead the planktonic life in order to escape from the invertebrates, in order to uh, encash the organic material that is available like that. So, see this spore. This is. Uh, uh, this is uh, varicosporium. Varicosporium, so this is very difficult to imagine that this is a spore because it has, it looks like a mycelia. So anybody in the, oh, it is a mycelia, mycelia, fungal mycelia, but it is not fungal mycelia. It is a spore and it has primary arm and the secondary arm and then tertiary arm. Like that, they keep on producing primary, secondary, tertiary arms and it is become a very complex uh, spore. Like even there is one spore uh, in named after uh, Professor Ingold, that is Ingoldella hamata. That is the Ingoldella hamata uh, is uh, Ingoldella genus. There are two species, Ingoldella hamata, um, and another species is there. They also produce primary, secondary arms, and also they produce hooks at the tip. So the the each hook will the hook will have two 
uh, hooks, not even single hook like that. So I have not, I don't have the figure here unfortunately. So these are all some of our figure, our pictures. Also, there are some pictures taken by us also. And the sigmoid uh, spores, that is uh, Angulospora crassa, Angulospora longissima, uh, that is Claveriana uh, aquatica. So the point of attachment is here. And uh, the, there is another arm, four arms will be there. And this is the point of attachment, Claveria aquatica. So this is the point of attachment here for the uh, Angulospora longissima. So here, this is a crescent light or moon light. Uh, partial moon like uh, spore, Lunulospora carula, has the attachment here. And this is another species of uh, Lunulospora, Lunulospora simbiformis. So that is protruded at the center. It has uh, attachment site here. So when you see the developmental morphology of these spores, so first they produce this arm, so the, this uh, arm, and, so, and the, this is the attachment site. At the last stage, it is going to produce the, another, the, the other part of the arm. Like that. Otherwise, the looks, when you see the developmental stage, you can understand how the spore will be produced. And uh, so this is uh, Trichelophorus uh, acuminatus, and this is Trichelophorus monosporus. This is the attachment site, and it has many septa here. So all these morphological features are very important to identify hepatic uh, hyphenicids. So if you look into the conidial output uh, from the detritus, I have already mentioned that it is going to get the fragile leaf material to the top, the uh, very weak acid and woody material, like that. So if you, usually uh, people will uh, start with leaf material, because leaf material can be collected and it can be analyzed rather than woody material. But woody material also can be studied. But according to Nielsen 1964, he reported that 300,000 species per leaf, a moderate size leaf, is going to produce approximately 300,000. So, these 300,000 spores are produced by leaf. So, what is the role of these organisms in the aquatic ecosystem? That was a very important question to address. Similarly, Verlocker in 1992, he reported that it is 1 million spores per leaf. So, if we calculate it, it is going to produce approximately 8 spores per microgram of leaf. So, that means it has a tremendous capacity to colonize the leaf material and produce conidia. And this conidia definitely follow the ruderal strategy, colonize, produce these spores, escape from the region because they have to escape from the other uh, leaf eating, detritus eating invertebrates. So Webster has reported in 1981, 30,000 conidia per liter. When you take one liter and filter it, you will get nearly 30,000 so these are all some surprising things to uh, initiate several studies at the community level. And what, what do they do? They are planktonic because they can float, because they have a uh, sigmoid type and also multiradiate type of uh, uh, the structure and they float. And because of this reason, they escape from the this uh, feeders like that. So conidial enumeration, uh, counting the conidia has become a method to assess uh, what is what are what is the composition of the community. So how many species are there? How many uh, how many species are very highly uh, very high number of conidia uh, like that? Uh, another uh, aspect is one can estimate the ATP. So ATP estimation will also give roughly about the uh, composition because they cannot produce so many thirty thousand or one million conidia um, per leaf. So that is how you can roughly. Yes, that ATP comes from this mycelia. And another signature uh, sterol, that is ergosterol. See, this ergosterol is almost something like that of uh, cholesterol in human beings and also stigmosterol in plants. So they are the uh, signature uh, sterol. So this filamentous fungi, all filamentous fungi uh, have ergosterol. Therefore, ergosterol can be estimated from the leaf material or from the culture or whatever and we can figure out how much of uh, ergosterol is present. So that is, uh, one can convert according to Gessner and Shave, 5.5 milligram ergosterol is equivalent to one gram of fungal biomass. biomass. So therefore, so we can take ergosterol is one of the authentic measure to evaluate the, the 
colonized material, colonization of aquatic hypomycin and the material, and also their function indirectly speaks that it is one of the major functions in freshwater body. So this is uh, the, the this is this picture is uh, developed by Professor Berlocker from Canada. Uh, he called boom bus cycle. So these are the successive events. I have already explained what are these uh, conidia, how are they peculiar in their uh, morphological features. And uh, I have I designated it as Berlocker's Berlo cycle. Uh, so I have already mentioned that they follow rural strategies. So you can take three events into consideration. Number one is arrival, departure, and biomass. So if you think of arrival, so the when they produce, when they colonize the leaf material, they need a little bit of time, and all of a sudden, the number of spores is going to shoot up in the water pot, depending on the flow conditions and the seasons like. So, so when you evaluate, with, with the time space, the number of conidia arrival on the leaf material is going to decrease. Then afterwards departure, yeah, after a very little gap afterwards, they colonize and produce a lot of spores and they attain peak at some stage and then they decline. This is the departure part and slightly later than the departure part, that is the fungi uh, or most of this uh, mycelia will be there and that will be converted into conidia and uh, they will depart and they, if you look into the biomass so the biomass of fungus is going to attain a peak and then come come down so here I, as i mentioned it has to follow the rural strategy to avoid the loss of material that is available for them as source of nutrients uh, this is uh, projected by that is referred as uh, this is the picture, global distribution of Ingoldian fungi. And you can see a lot of gaps here. See this uh, Asian part, uh, northern region is, there are no uh, bullet points here because the not work made very much work here. And even China, very few, uh, some, it is 2016 literature, some eight or nine, like that, and Australia, and also so part of South Africa also not, African continent also not evaluated to that extent. And up to as recently, a lot of uh, South American parties under concentration and also North America, where this also the Greenland and other regions are also not evaluated. But this is, uh, this point is Hawaii. Hawaii is about uh, 4,000 uh, miles away from the mainland and that is colonized by and who has taken this uh, freshwater fungi across the saline water that is the question anyway uh, but if you look into the biogeography uh, species richness peaks at mid mid altitude mid latitude as i mentioned is that uh, the perlocker and duarte and his group has worked on this uh, because of the available literature they come to some conclusion that the mid altitude is where the uh, there is peak takes place like that and uh, as and when the distance uh, from the uh, that is geographic distance if you calculate in kilometers the gd community similarity is going to decrease right? that's why uh, uh, the ingold has foresight that it is possible to guess the uh, latitude of a particular stream or the river if you look into the composition of the uh, ingoldian fungi in foam like that so anyway, this is another picture, how vast this is, species richness, they have, based on the published work, they have taken the species richness as yes, and sampling effort as SE, and uh, now the current situation is, we know about approximately, uh, almost close to that, or less than 50% of the efforts like that. So this is based on again publication. So next slide is going to provide you very correct picture. So we have achieved only 50%, approximately 50%. So that is, from a particular region, if you meticulously assess the, uh, the aquatic fungi or the Ingoldian fungi, so you need 20, 29 research papers per region to document 50% of the species. So different regions, different seasons, uh, different locations, 
different substrates, all these things are necessary to achieve 50 percent of uh, the one. And if you want to achieve 90 percent, as I mentioned here, 90 percent, you have to uh, enhance the activity. That is, you need 275 substrates per region to achieve the 90 percent uh, species uh, role or species uh, recognition like that. Anyway, we are lagging because not not much of not much of interest towards uh, but hands on like so uh, the requirement is tenfold intensive study is needed that's what uh, this figure you know, this figure is going to indicate and among the 15 geographic regions surveyed northern temperate I have already shown that uh, picture northern temperate and tropics western hemisphere and European temperate and tropical Asia eastern hemisphere meet only 50 percent. When you put everything together, approximately 50 percent. I can say that it may be less than 50 percent. None of them meets 90 percent of target. So therefore, you can realize how much of efforts is necessary to understand this community in freshwater body. Insufficient surveys need for global perspectives and uniform methodology. But very few groups are working. You look into this uh, in Canada. The local group is working in Portugal. Um, uh, Fernanda Casio uh, and uh, uh, Claudia Pascal and group they are working and in Switzerland um, Eric Schawe is working and Germany Mark Gessner is working and in Germany um, um, uh, the Diet Mark Clauser is working like that and uh, in, uh, in India of course our group and such group and uh, by the uh, Borsay, BD Borsay like that. And uh, of course, Australian reports are uh, not very much nowadays like that. Anyway, this gives a general idea about that. Uh, what is the extent of work can be carried out in aquatic ecology? So, in general, ecological roles. If you think of ecological roles, uh, actually, this is the uh, saprophytic uh, fungi, saprophytic pool, pool, and this is zooplankton, and this is the art of uh, Autochthonous organic matter, like that. Where the, there are two important uh, aspects looked into. One is the energy from sun. Freshwaters get the energy from sun. And also, another source of energy is plant litter. Plant litter. This is another source. Of course, plant litter comes from only energy, the photons only. But that is major part of that will be added into the streams, like that. And then here the activity takes place. This uh, Post particulate uh, organic matter will be converted into fine particulate ma organic matter and uh, the uh, fine particulate organic matter and uh, uh, rest of the things will taken taken over and there is a lot of cross talk between the uh, the autochthonous organic matter where zooplankton and other organisms will be there parasitic fungi will also be there so this is uh, uh, mycoflex and this is mycoloop. And again, you can see this uh, benthic uh, shunt where a lot of organs are there. There is connection here. Right? So these connections are not very well established, but there is a prediction. But again, this is uh, there is connection for the fishes. Like anyway, ultimately, we are all depending on this right, group of organisms because they they perform very important segment of the uh, aquatic body. And ultimately, we get the prawns and shrimps and the crabs, whatever freshwater uh, products we can get is mainly because of the part of the role played by uh, these things. And this is another picture. Um, actually, it was the picture where they have depicted horizontal and vertical diversity. The horizontal diversity is increasing the vertical diversity like that. Similarly, uh, the extent of decomposition. When it decomposition progress and the energy flow also progress. By that, the product will be So here, detritus is the post particulate organic matter will be converted by the decomposers, decomposition by biodegradation by aquatic fungi, and then product pool where we can get fine particulate organic matter, dissolved organic matter, and uh, this again detritus ores are. There is connection between detritivores, shredders, and the aquatic fungi. Detritus and detritus, detritivores and aquatic fungi, the competition for the utilization of detritus. And ultimately, decomposition takes place, and 
this again aquatic fauna uh, productivity will be uh, achieved and again product after this productivity but fauna will also generate so many important product tools to the uh, ecosystem so this is a very rough idea about the uh, decomposition and energy flow so what are the other ecological services of this fresh water fish uh uh but i have some more time to continue i have another maybe 10 slides uh sir please go ahead yeah uh you please uh, give me a signal if you are very much bored with this i uh, i would prefer we finish by 3:30 including the discussion you can take 10 more minutes sir thank you okay. no no much earlier i will finish another maybe 15 20 minutes maybe. okay sir thank you uh, Okay. Ecological services, if you think of ecological services, decomposition is very, very important. Conversion of uh, CPOM, coarse particulate matter to fine particulate matter and to dissolved organic matter. Like that. So, this, uh, uh, when you take a particular organic matter, approximately 63 to 100 percent uh, fungal biomass exists in dead trees. So, that is a very surprising thing, 63 percent to 100 percent fungal biomass in detritus. What is the role of this organism if it is so much of biomass in the detritus? So then uh, fungal production is uh, evaluated by very rate of me, variety of means where it is surpassing the bacterial production. Because you know very well that bacteria is surface dependent. But fungi are not surface dependent because they are mycelioid. They can penetrate into the woody material or leaf material and encash the uh, organic matter that is available. But uh, bacteria has to uh, depend on surface available. When surface is, sufficient surface is not available, probably they may not work there. But, uh, but fungi is not like that. If, even though surface area is less, they can colonize. The fungal biomass, if you take fungal biomass, 18 percent of the total detritus mass, 18 percent of the approximately one-fifth of the biomass is fungal biomass. So that's how uh, the calculations calculation goes. Up to 80 per, so what happens when they have enormous biomass, they have to produce the conidia or they have to reproduce. They have to go and catch other substrate like. So up to 80 percent of fungal biomass allocated for spore production. From 18 percent uh, of the total biomass considered as 100 percent. Uh, from that nearly 80 percent will be fungal biomass will be allocated for spore production. That's why they are going to produce approximately 3, uh, 300,000 conidia per litre and or 1 million conidia per leaf material or 8 conidia per microgram of uh, this uh, detritus like that or leaf material. So, so what uh, uh, prediction here is the rest of the 20 percent will be protected there itself or if it is a woody material, it will stay there and probably they may invest this for the perfect state generation. So according to the present uh, situation, out of 335 morpho species of freshwater fungi known, only 30 of them have perfect imperfect connections. So not all, because uh, the, nowadays we do not find any paper discussing about the perfect and imperfect connections of freshwater fungi, but that shows that how much we have invested our efforts in there. So the food web, that is palatability and insect metamorphosis. Here, what happens, the insects, there are several types of insects. So some of them are sluggish, some of them are moderately sluggish or they may crawlers and some of them are highly mobile. For example, Gamaris. Gamaris is amphipod, it is highly mobile and it can choose particular part of the leaf material and eat. That means it is going to choose particular place where mycomycetes are very high and it will eat the biomass like that. But another group, if you caddis fly, it is crawling type of uh, insect and it, are, it is less efficient than gamaris. Another one is tipula, it is uh, very sluggish and it is lying in the bottom and they have to get whatever it get, it can it can engulf or it can uh, eat, uh, consume. Uh, but what happens, the, the, the situation is this, uh, although tipula is sluggish, 
but its intestinal morphology, intestinal physiology has been tuned in such a way that although it is going to be a little bit or the recalcitrant material may not be uh, fungal colonization may not be too much there, but it has its physiology is such that it can digest some of the organic matter very efficiently because of its physiology. Even cat is fly too. But gamaras may have less efficiency, but it has mobile, it, it can move around and choose the material of its interest. So therefore, the, the intestinal physiology has been tuned, fine-tuned uh, for, the, for the survival of these, all these organs. Anyway, the footwear, that is palatability, is, I have written as insect morph, uh, metamorphosis. So this insect, some of the insects, are uh, not completely surviving in only aquatic situations. So what they do is they are arboreal and uh, lay the eggs in the aquatic situation or semi-aquatic where the nutrients are available and they become, uh, they mature and afterwards they become arboreal. So again, again the insect comes to the semi-aquatic or aquatic situation, lay the eggs and uh, the, the, this type of life cycle of uh, insect metamorphosis is mainly because of the, the availability of fungal biomass. Fungal biomass. If this situation is going to change because of human interference or other interference, definitely these insects are going. We are going to lose this insect because they may not emerge as uh, arboreal insect, and they cannot lay the eggs again. And this section we may, this insect may die. Like that. anyway, the fatty acids are very important because. In, for insect metamorphosis, fatty acids are very, very important and enzymes are important in digestion. Therefore, so the material like the, the sterols, like uh, uh, ergosterol and such things are very, very important for uh, insect metamorphosis. Otherwise, the metamorphosis will not take place like that. So that's how this energy flow takes place. So again, I have to uh, discuss about the decomposition. Decomposition is every man's response to the to what fungi do that has been offered by Christian in 1989. And there are a lot of structural polymers, cellulose, semicellulose, pectin, lignin, and they are all very crucial for fungal success because they have very good enzymes. Uh, changing land use, that is, a lot of perturbation taking place in the recent past. The per perturbation of the riparian zone, riparian trees are cut, or they are affecting. By that, the input of the leaf material or the organic material will become less and uh, not channeling, uh, the eutrophication and pollution and climate change, all these have some impact on them. And anyway, uh, these organisms will suffer because. So here is major pathways of fatty acid food chain. On many occasions it is very, very important because this is linoleic acid to uh, arachidonic acid. And here it is uh, uh, the algae and plants uh, that is omega-3 pathway, that is alpha-linolenic acid, linolenic acid to eicosapentanoic acid and docosahexanoic acid. You know very well now why this uh, omega-3 fatty acid is very, very important. And where, this is where the higher animals, omega-6 pathway, that is linole linoleic acid, where it will be converted to alpha-linolenic acid, that is algae, fungi, plants and other organisms play a very, very important role here. So this is how the, our, this uh, metamorphosis of insects will be aquatic insects or partially living aquatic insects will be affected. But, and also another reason is the, why these aquatic invertebrates are preferring the fungal colonized leaf material is mainly because they can enrich the food material, enrich the, uh, the detritus material in terms of proteins and in terms of fatty acids. So this is the attraction and sometimes they may get a lot of uh, uh, growth factors from the detritus material that has been the condition by the freshwater hypermarkets. So this uh, picture is going to show you, uh, I have taken this picture from a uh, hyper polluted, heavy metal polluted central Germany where they have a lot of uh, uh, adjustments with the particular situation. So our surprisingly we got a lot of uh, uh, aquatic agomyces in uranium polluted region and uh, the hyper polluted habitat in central Germany. So this is going to show you a pathway how the metabolic adjustment they have made where they produce uh, the metallothionins and then phytochelatines 
and they have adaptability to such things because so the in central germany a lot of uh, uh, mines are abandoned and uh, during the russian period and all these dumps were left there itself without any processing processing whatever heavy materials metal metals were there that has seepage into the streams and rivers and where aquatic organisms may be there earlier and they have adapted for such situation but you can definitely find very less diversity in such type of high polluted conditions so the question always comes to in everybody that are they really aquatic uh, that's what we so there is a publication in 2016 beyond water column other than water column where do we find so they are in the canopy so when you take any the two falls jump flow you can find fresh water and they are fresh water and they like organs and uh, the stream habitats it is usual and also estuarine conditions some of the estuarine conditions with the low salinity where we can find many fresh water like my six and hypo reach zones hypo reach zones are nothing but biofilms and also the sediment the percolate between the sediment and the sediment the lot of panjai uh, will be there that is by, by uh, that is the hypore zones and also uh, in the um, lentic habitat where the stagnant water is not floating it is not moving or is stagnant but still some of the panjai can find in such situation uh, so what are the other niches in a broader context so the first one is submerged bank areas is the substrate flowing water because they grow and they are plankton because they can resist the uh, against the water flow by that they are going to catch them because the the situation is if they are multi radiate or sigmoid uh, multi radiate means their tips are uh, damaged or their tips are producing mucilaginous like material and it is clingering into the uh, the substrate that is available that's so which they can avoid uh, Push through the water, and uh, ultimately they catch the substrate very efficiently because of their morphological, uh, morphological, morphologically uh, varied type of spores. And hyperreus, where sediments and biofilms are very important, foam and scum. Where if you see any foam or scum in the stream, stream like, and if you collect it, you will find enormous number of fungi in that uh, fungal spores. so that is they congregate so that's why uh, many occasions uh, the uh, the leaf material will be put into the bubble chamber when you put it in bubble chamber it is going to the spores are going to congregate and then the because of mechanical disturbance the fungi that is colonized leaf material will generate lot of spores they need little bit of mechanical uh, disturbance by that they produce lot of spores and they can be like that. in sediments can find live plant tissues have been reported so especially roots and hydrophytes and even canopy um, they have reported as endophytes uh, particular that is partially submerged plant detritus in stream borders and temporary aquatic habitats or intermittent habitats and the stream slopes where a lot of scope is there for the colonization of these organisms maybe in the form of perfect stream and they may Uh, transform into stream and then follow the imperfect state because the imperfect stream may be one of the features where it demands because of the fragile nature of the detritus material. And if it is this uh, stubborn material like woody material, they may produce perfect stream. Uh, lot of work has been done by Dr. Uh, John Webster and also Descartes. They have done this uh, perfect imperfect connections earlier. The animals. Uh, they also you can also find in the intestine of some of these gemmaras and other organisms and even fishes uh, intestine if you see the fecal pellets of the fishes and also uh, gemmaras you can find uh, live spores that will pass through the intestine that means that is how they will be disseminated from one region to another region salt influence the habitats like the cities and canopy or boreal like that uh, so this is uh, Um, yeah, I have put a small slide here with regard to the studies carried out in Western Ghats. Uh, anamorphic taxa, uh, approximately 100 species have been reported in the Western Ghats, uh, belong to 55 genera. It is accounting about 30% of the known species. 
richness uh, is higher in high altitude to mid altitude. So if you take the single axis as a, so it is more than 2000 uh, meters high and then mid altitude about 500 uh, meters and then the slope like that. So where it almost like uh, we are comparing the latitude. So mid altitude has more number of richness is more, diversity is more in the mid latitude. And uh, as and when it uh, comes down, the diversity decreases. Uh, and of course, other organs like uh, ascomyces and all the 50 species have been reported in 30 genera. Aeroaquatics also there. Aeroaquatic fungi are something which is different, where they produce a sort of coiled spores, where they trap the air bubble. By that, they can float. Right? And their strategy of survival is aeroaquatic. So they prefer little bit of aquatic condition and when they expose the air, they produce the spores like that. Anyway, uh, this mid-latitude uh, of teams, uh, are they hot spots of diversity? That question always arises. In uh, Western Ghats, there is one stream known as Sampaji stream. It is about 500 meters above sea level and that is really a hot spot. Um, when you evaluate water, foam and liquid and canopy and uh, different seasons, and the conditions, uh, that substrate like leaf, bark, wood, a root litter, like that. The live parts as uh, live parts of hydrophytes, they are living within underwater and roots. And a lot of methods can be applied. That is water filtration, direct observation, damp incubation, bubble chamber incubation, and latex trapping. And uh, rosin, rosin is um, carbohydrate. Uh, uh, polymer uh, coated slides are going to trap very efficiently. Very recently, we found the latex coated, like banyan latex or this uh, uh, jack autocarpus, uh, the latex is going to trap uh, fungi, uh, especially conidia. So, that can be used as one of the techniques, uh, short, uh, short duration technique to trap the um, fungal spores in the streams. Aquatic organization Sampaja stream. In one shot, if you go for one sampling, you will get up to 90 species. So that is amazing. So the, what we predicted that mid-altitude is having high diversity is true. It is accounting approximately 27% of the, uh, the total species known. And uh, latex trapping, if you use the latex trapping technique, within 24 hours, if you follow diurnal pattern, you will get at least 50 species. So these are all some of the development uh, taken place quite recently. Uh, there is one theory known as uh, bus decking hypothesis, 1934, um, that has been put forward. Everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. So this is very interesting. So lot of organs that I have already mentioned somewhere, uh, lot of organs, micro, a lot of fungi exists, but they start performing depending on the situation. If the situation is worse, then it can partially perform, not fully. Right? So therefore, everything is everywhere, but environment selects. So environmental conditions are not good. If it is polluted, then they are uh, highly affected. So small organisms, especially less than 2 mm, have cosmopolitan distribution. There is one report by Pinchel and Finlay, 2004, we found protists in a small lake, in a small lake, as previously described from the entire world. So the protists present in the lake is in, sing, in a single lake. He got protists. It can be comparable with the described species of the entire world. Right. Therefore, the, this uh, bus baking hypothesis is, seems to be true that the conditions prevailing is very important to encash a particular organism or a, organi a particular fungal efficiency. So this, I have, I keep telling, uh, I keep mentioning many occasions in my lectures that the biodiversity, when biodiversity increases, the ecological services also increases. So this is how, the bio when, when biodiversity is perfect, the ecological services will also come down. So if you look into the diversity, so what happens is diversity is uh, will be maximum at the, at the, uh, the level of disturbance should not be too much and the level of disturbance will be too low. Right? 
so you will not find any ecosystem where there is no disturbance there will be definitely there will be some disturbance but moderate disturbance is going to boost the diversity to the higher level so therefore we have to figure out up to what extent we can we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, tap a particular ecosystem without impinging the diversity because then diversity is high so the ecological services will be more and the level of disturbance we have to figure out how, how much we can tap particular ecosystem anything for that matter maybe a forest maybe an aquatic body or whatever so the structure and function uh, so i have already mentioned many occasions leaf litter breakdown and uh, guidelines to control human impact and uh, we can be used as indicators of pollution as a pollutant and uh, tax almost doubled especially because of the uh, pyro sequencing p4 i4 uh, pyro sequencing then the conidial pumps because the now the, te the, the techniques are uh, improved therefore pyro sequencing is going to give more more uh, value more information about the role of uh, especially freshwater fungi or any fungi in different ecosystems uh, so again this is redundant information that is temperature ph conductivity domestic and urban waste or returning agricultural chemicals and industrial activities and waste uh, and also exotic tree species eucalyptus acacia pivia silver oak these are all some of the exotic tree species are also affecting the aquatic ecosystem to some extent uh, dist distribution of riparian vegetation and nanoparticles because we are using a lot of material made up of nanoparticles nanoparticles ultimately enter into the streams and xenobiotics these are all pollution related and what are the possible approaches population and community ecology so this we are we are going to deal with the community therefore your guess will be more accurate rather than working with single organs we are going to work with 50 different species what do they do in a particular ecosystem so decomposition um, that is stable material to fragile and the quantitative studies induction of perfect state as i mentioned canopy tree holes through fall and stem flow because tree holes uh, phytotelmeta so that is uh, the the tree hole ecology is nowadays uh, interesting because lot of people are working on tree holes here are aquatic habitats root endophytes and uh, stress tolerance and bioremediation all such things are important so there are some simple methods to study freshwater fungi that is water filtration is not a very big thing. we can use 5 micron or 8 micron filters and filter it and stain it and observe the pore morphology is very beautiful we can identify the species uh, to some generic level and species level. foam analysis in collecting the foam fixing it in formalin acidic alcohol of the particular concentration and you can analyze and evaluate it and leaf litter incubation in bubble chambers so you cut the leaf the detritus material or the leaf material into small pieces or disc and put it in sterile dish water and you inject air sterile air Uh, using aquarium aerators like that, and by that because of this mechanical disturbance, whatever biomass present in the leaf material will ultimately produce spores. All these spores will produce, and then you can filter the water and count the number of spores and calculate how much of detritus you have used per gram or per milligram dry mass, how much it is produced. Like that, that can be calculated. Leaf baiting can also be used. Latex and rope imported, like I have mentioned. So there are. more methods direct methods indirect methods conidia filtering and ethyl uh, fluorescent microscopy micelle biomass detect packing foam induction ergosterol chitin mass loss leaf mass loss can be taken as an index k value or how much how much time half life how much time takes 50% decomposition of a particular organic material and uh, transplant experiment can be done molecular approaches are available nowadays and dna barcoding pyro sequencing and uh, ecosystem to uh, address can be it can be very precisely addressed by molecular approaches and blend of conventional and molecular approaches are very important so they serve as model mycota or meso and mycopausis laboratory field and laboratory studies 
And one can take this as variables. Impaction, that is attachment to the surface. Colonization, pattern of colonization and spore. Sporulation, and spore dispersal, and spore germination. All these events can serve as variables in, in evaluating particular ecosystem. Uh, there are a lot of uh, preservation strategies one can think of. Cryptic species, so very low percentage of spores uh, are very low in number in cryptic species or hidden species. Core group, that is more than 10% difference of occurrence. Keystone species, some species are going to support other species. Quantitative data, in situ conservation. So these are all some of the points to remember uh, about this. And there are a lot of gaps. Uh, wood and sediment. So recently we have studied wood material, earth material, where apatrisma is colonizing uh, to that extent, not to the extent of leaf material, but they are colonized by them and they are going to be overlapping habitats like aeropathic, terrestrial, entic. Most productive outliers, mid altitudes and mid latitudes are very, very important ecosystem or the uh, uh, hotspots of diversity. And the undefined quantity. If you take any any study, definitely there will be some uh, up to ten percent unknown species will be. That indicates that there are so many species among them. Crypt species, symbionts, core group, and keystone species. Perfect imperfect connections. The two uh, there are two unsettled issues. One is pattern of diversity. Alpha that is regional, beta community, cosmopolitan endemism and evolution. So these are the, this is one of the major gaps. Second one is integrated approach, blend the taxonomic, phylogenetic, functional diversity of local scale with metagenomic approach. Uh, there are so many tasks, stream catchments, agriculture activities, plantations, stream channeling, again, removal of obstructions is always detrimental because they cannot accumulate debris, like in vegetation, Removal of vegetation and vegetation and removal of canopy, inputs of detritus, leaf, wood, and others will be affected. Impact of exotic plant species, identification and preservation of hotspots. So these are some of the uh, aspects we look with. So I'm highly thankful to uh, this uh, opportunity given by my Asia to present uh, my views about the um, Panjai. Uh, in aquatic ecosystem. Mangrove University has uh, supported me a lot to do this work. And the NFIA University also recently supporting me. And my PhD students, out of uh, 25 students, four or five students carried out studies on freshwater fungi. By that, I could uh, enhance my knowledge. So thank you very much for your patient listening. If you have any questions, you are welcome. Thank you, Professor Sridhar. Thank you very much. It has been a, a very insightful and a, a very, very, yes, how do I say, um, very, very nostalgic experience for me personally because I just remembered my MSc classes from Mangalore University during 2000 to 2002. Uh, now we will move to the question and answer session. Uh, if uh, uh, if any question, queries are there, please do ask now. Thank you. So we, one can uh, uh, put some questions in the chat box. I can see and I can answer if it is uh, possible from my side. Uh, there is one question, uh, Niranjan has asked. Uh, sir, how many fungi recorded from India and uh, northeastern India? So, altogether, uh, uh, we have uh, about uh, 125 species have been reported from India so far, approximately. 125 means 25 to 30 percent of uh, species known. Uh, that is 335 morpho species. Out of that, we are a uh, little bit above 100 species. In the Western Ghats itself, we can get 80 to 90 species, and uh, we have added some more species, especially in northern India, uh, in the Nainital, 
that is a different ecosystem altogether. Lot of uh, different species are there. They are resembling the temperate uh, region, and uh, we have uh, we have very close to 125 to 130 species. Some of them are common to Western Ghats and uh, Himalayan region or the uh, Nainital region. Uh, how do we calculate or estimate uh, transition events that is aquatic terrestrial terrestrial than aquatic like that so it is uh, uh, the, the experience our experience what says that it is possible to get more quantity more number of species in the uh, aquatic situation lotic situation compared to the, the terrestrial situation so you can find the species in terrestrial region, but the spore production and the species are not to the extent we can find in the aquatic situation. So for example, if you collect some of the leaf litter from the border of the stream and evaluate it, you will get some species. They will correlate. They are live. And similarly, you can take uh, the, uh, the, the, the stem flow or the bark flow or through fall from the tree. There also we can get some aquatic hypomyces, but their diversity is not to the extent what we can find in the streams. So, but they are surviving. So, who is going to transport these organisms from stream to canopy, or stream to border, or stream to terrestrial region, like that? It is really questioning. Many occasions it is questionable. Many occasions uh, the insects are maybe uh, responsible, or birds may be responsible to transport because their legs are in the water and they may eat something and they may fly away sit on the tree and they may like that and the tree ecosystem tree canopy itself an ecosystem for colonization like, depending on the conditions like so if you take mangalore as an example we have we will have torrential rain for about six months three to four to five to six months and the year before last year it was almost six months like this so the, that is the situation there is no difference between stream and the terrestrial region because it is always water is flowing from the canopy and uh, the, it is almost like aquatic water. And I feel that there are some insects may carry, birds may carry and uh, some of them may carry it by perfect states. Perfect state. They may produce perfect state. The escospores can live in the air for a longer period rather than the uh, asexual spores. Therefore, they will be transmitted to different parts of the terrestrial region. Uh, are these species found in unpolluted waters? Uh, that is Vijay, uh, that is uh, Cyril has asked me a question. Are these species found in unpolluted waters or polluted water? Any species specific to polluted waters? So we have reported several species in the polluted waters. And uh, they also, their number is very high in the unpolluted waters rather than the polluted water. And some of them may be resistant to pollution like that. They might have evolved, especially in the Germany, hyperpolluted region, several species are there. They are uh, uh, adapted to that condition, but not the diversity is not high. But a few species exist in a polluted region. Unpolluted region, they are going to flourish like anything. And Devadatta has one question, whether the Ingoldian fungi, whether the Ingoldian fungi occurs in mangrove as well, Many thanks for your wonderful work. Okay. So, yes, it is uh, definitely available in the Ingolden fungi in the mangrove situation. I have reported, I have a few research papers published uh, that is the uh, presence of aquatic hypomyces in the mangrove situation. And uh, depending on the salinity, they are going to, because the fresh water is going to flush a lot of organic material to the uh, estuarine situation or the mangrove situation. And there they may survive up to some extent, but the high salinity sometimes they may, uh, but some of them may be adopted for such situations. For your information, Devadatta, I have got some freshwater fungi in the uh, tree, uh, through fall and stem flow of mangrove uh, plants like Rhizophora, Micronata, and also this uh, uh, Avicinia, Avicinalis. So that means there is some connection will be there for freshwater fungi. They may be also, they also there, but not to the extent where we can get in freshwater condition. There is one more question by Vinit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Rajesh Kumar. Uh, he has thanked me. Uh, he has whether the host diversity have significantly influenced the uh, fungi diversity in the stream. Definitely, definitely they influence because uh, the whatever the native plants of the Western Ghats are very important. So, for example, banyan is a keystone species. So, according to my experience in the Western Ghats and uh, even especially in the West Coast, banyan leaf is an excellent material to study aquatic hypomyces, freshwater hypomyces. So, almost like alder leaves in, in Europe and also in North America, they use alder leaves as one of the material where they, uh, they colonize. And very recently, we worked with alder leaves because they, we have worked on one aspect, that is, they have sent us alder leaves. These alder leaves, we have, in, we have introduced into uh, Dr. Sina Sahadevan has worked on this aspect. And uh, these uh, alder leaves were introduced into 19 different parts of the world in fresh waters. And they evaluated the uh, fungi. And uh, ultimately, they have come to conclusion. Because the uniformity in the substrate is important in order to come to some conclusion. So for our, for our context in, the, in India, southern India, banyan is very well and it is very good. And also it is very, it is a keystone species and the leaves are excellent material for, uh, because you can get in one leaf, you may get nearly 20 to 25 species to one leaf if you study that, like that. Uh, Niru Niranjan has asked one more question. Uh, sir, is there any aquatic fungi that have terrestrial teleomorph fungal fungal connection? Definitely it has connection. So if, I, if you want, I will send some literature on this uh, connection, how they are uh, the terrestrial teleomorph and aquatic uh, anamorph, <laughs> like that. And because when it's the teleomorph means it is it may go out of stream. It may that's why uh, the you can find in the terrestrial situation, because in the teleomorphic stage, it will be distributed outside the stream, like that. So, the, 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 there is one aspect we can discuss here, especially with regard to marine fungi and freshwater fungi. Freshwater fungi consists of more of hyphomycetes, but ascomycetes are also there. I don't say no, but hyphomycetes are plenty. But in marine, more of ascomycetes and less of, uh, that is, uh, imperfect fungi, or this uh, uh, anamorphic. Yeah. Uh, can these fungi uh, that grow uh, in polluted waters be considered as pollution indicator? Definitely you can use that indicator species. Definitely one can use that, that as indicator species because some of them uh, probably they might have adapted or they may, the metabolic activities are totally different from the uh, strain what we get in fresh water. So that we have to take into account. But some of these aquatic hypomyces are tolerant to pollution level. Therefore, we can think of indicator species. I think we have done one work on uh, on indicator species. I have a couple of papers with me. If you want, I will send it to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your compliments. Any more queries? Any more questions from the audience, please? Uh, there is one more question. Uh, can you please suggest some hosts which are rich with aquatic fungi? Uh, I have already suggested that banyan leaf is the excellent material for that. But for it may differ from region to region. In Europe and uh, North America, they use alder leaves, common ones. Like yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the, therefore, uh, in my opinion, we can, I, of course, we can use rubber leaves, hevia leaves also, one of the materials. So if you, if you compare uh, the rubber leaves and the banyan leaves, uh, rubber leaves, uh, banyan leaves are going to stay for longer duration. It is good to spend leaves what happens it is going to become fragile within within a couple of one or two days like that so therefore you can select the uh, leaf material uh, it should not be too fragile like that. so 
so if it is too fragile you have to design a different method to study uh, how this uh, the big probably they may be very nutritious they may grow and they may and you can take some rubber leaves from the stream it will be completely deskeleton all right? you can see only skeleton right? so therefore uh, such type of activity depends on uh, how much of pollutants are there in water body and if it is not polluted it may happen like that if it is pollution then the fragile material also stay for a long period right uh, one more question please uh, devadatta has mentioned please mention some of the best methods to culture the ingoldium fungi so the best method to culture the ingoldium fungi is uh, mm, see this uh, uh, what we can do is you can use the foam material unfixed foam material can be used and uh, if you dilute it to some extent and the drop it from the top to the um, to the substrate to, to the media um, particular medium consisting of antibiotic for anthony call by that you can you can take a petri plate and put the drop at one of the borders and you slightly uh, tilt it so what happens whatever spores are there will come down like that and here and there the spores will cling so you can see under the microscope and where are which are all the places where the spores are there you can mark it next day you can cut it and put into the new medium you, you can get the culture can be established uh, that is another england england finder is there but it's very i don't know i have not used it but this is the method i have followed to isolate the fungi from the aquatic body uh, or you can simply take a small quantity of foam material and uh, you put it at the top and spread it like that with very lightly because the, the spore may and you can uh, see the spore also then you can isolate the next day because it germinates next day germinated one you can take that uh, piece of agar and put into uh, fresh slide preferably with uh, fresh uh, fresh media preferably with uh, antibiotic right uh, yeah and uh, what is the available information about the aquatic deciduomycetes uh, according to me there are very few aquatic deciduomycetes not many but dr bose has published recently one paper on aquatic deciduomycetes so th there may be not more than uh, some half a dozen or so seven or eight species not more than that so ingoldella hamata is one of them ingoldella ibulata is another they are because the uh, the uh, imperfect state of that or the uh, mitosporic state itself shows some clamp connections so that's why we can say that it is a best domain but it is uh, uh, that is produced by the mycelia will produce that but perfect state is different so that is uh, done by dr webster has established the perfect imperfect connection for the uh, ingoldella hamata uh, yeah uh thank you very much for information method of isolation and also mandru ingolian okay thank you any any i think i have answered most of the questions sir so i have one query sir <laughs> yeah please so do we have some information about uh, possible effects of ingolian fungi on the human digestive system uh no no one has checked in no, no one has evaluated that uh, but i had a, an idea that when you have uh, pure cultures can we look into these uh, amino acids and fatty acids so if they have essential amino acids probably mass cultivation can be done or if they are good producers of uh, essential fatty acids uh, but i could not materialize so far because i have to generate the cultures and then evaluate the uh, amino acids and also they definitely they are useful to human being like that Uh, as nutritional source, but uh, but uh, unlike the terrestrial fungi, the growth is very slow. When you take it in nutrient agar, they grow about one centimeter diameter. It is going to take not less than fifteen days, two weeks. <laughs> It is very slow growing. But we have to find out the means how to grow in a faster rate, or we have to provide some substrate where they can multiply or produce biomass in large quantity. then we can evaluate the nutrition quality of that definitely it is very helpful for the aquatic organisms we have seen uh, spores in the fecal pellets of fishes 
and uh, some of the frogs we have seen, fecal pellets of frogs, consists of aquatic isomyces. And uh, inverter, many invertebrates possess this uh, uh, fungal spores, live spores in the fecal pellet. That means they are eating this detritus along with the spores, and that's how we can get it. So one more query I have, sir. Can the uncontrolled growth of involdian fungi in fresh water cause hmm. stomach upset in human beings? Uncontrolled growth in fresh water? If we drink that fresh water with lots of involdian fungi, can it cause uh, some stomach? I, I don't think that I don't think that it will affect the human beings because okay. Okay. Uh, all, uh, we are not pathogenic organisms. Okay. Uh, I think there is only one pathogen has been reported in. Golden fungi, not more than that. Only one fungi, one oh. or two, not many. Okay. But uh, if it is there, our system is going to digest, no problem. Oh. And it will not cause any problem for the intestine. I'm sure we are going to drink a lot of golden fungi if you take stream water in Western Ghats or in the coastal region like that. It will not affect, uh, uh, they are all friendly organisms, friendly fungi. Okay, sir, thank you. I think uh, we now we'll i will uh, ask uh, request uh, dr nalin to propose the vote of thanks dr nalin please thank you okay uh, <clears throat> thank you dr chenoy uh, professor Hila, i'm really glad uh, you have to your, uh, agreeing to do this nice lecture actually and it's, it's a great honor to be in the, our micro Michael, team as well and we have learned a lot of things. And the other thing is, we will be uh, uh, we're starting some works on the freshwater fungal works in Sri Lanka soon. So we will uh, invite you to be a one of our collaborators in the future. Okay, thank so, you very much. And, and uh, Professor Cyril is there. He is the actually main advisor in, in, in that case because his institute will be the Post Institute on that aquatic fungal uh, project, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Shema, I, I really help. thank you, thank you for uh, thankful for your kind, kindly doing this uh, collaboration with Professor Seder and inviting him to do this nice lecture. And before we conclude this session, I would like to mention about the next lecture. Uh, the ne next next speaker will be Professor Cyril J. Sundara. So at the moment he is a professor at uh, National Institute of Fundamental Studies in Sri Lanka and he is a former director general of botanical gardens in Sri Lanka. So uh, and most probably we, we are going to talk about the uh, the topic that, that that we are interested how to how to implement mycological studies in the South region and how, how what what is the role of the country. Uh, that, that would be the topic at the moment. So, but the, uh, the exact topic will be announced soon. And uh, and all the participants, we are really grateful to you in this session. And thank you so much. And we are going to conclude this session today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for our patience, all of you, for the patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you darling. Okay. Bye everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sida.